Hey Rap Bags, it's Jade here today with over 50 tips that you need to know. I've kind of put together a little few starting ones, maybe some for mid game and end game, explaining a little bit better about crafting, some of the things I wish I knew. Grounded has been around for two years, has had lots of changes and with 1.0 there's a whole host of new stuff gone into the game. This isn't a starter guide because I feel like some of my older ones still hold up pretty well but I will be doing some brand new stuff as well as experienced players look out for even more advanced guides and location videos for the upper yard. I've got a few timestamps if you want to skip ahead if you think you know it all and hopefully this will just help some of you guys that may be revisiting Grounded or still finding it a bit tough after playing for the last two weeks. If you do find it useful, please leave a like. YouTube says that if you want to see more of my content, then liking the video is the best thing you can do. And as always, for the best in Grounded Guides gameplay news, make sure you're subscribed. Let's go. The field stations serve as a respawn point. If you die, you'll respawn at the last one you was closest to. So in the early days, you don't even have to make a bed or a lean-to. You'll just keep simply respawning to the one you found. There's 14 of these and they count as landmarks, so never pass up the opportunity to find one as it helps with the resource analyzer and the surveyor so you can find more items. Obvious tip, but scan everything. Make sure you're checking the field stations regularly to see if they've recharged or find every field station that you can so you can scan all the resources. The surveyor itself, some of the items you only need to have come across hence why you can scan for dew drops and stuff like that without actually scanning them and some items you will have to actually use the resource scanner. Remember bug parts might be in lots of different creatures so for spider parts that may be lots of spiders not just a particular one that you want to hunt. It should pop up as a little red square where the resources are. Obviously you need to make sure you've activated all the points to scan the whole map which there should be coverage for if you've gone and activated every field station. Orange squares mean there's not that much of it, yellow squares means there's a bit more, and then green squares means there's quite a lot of that resource. Obviously you do need to activate the resource scanners first, so make sure you go and jump off here when you go first, the first zip line in the hedge, and then you should find it in this secret little laboratory. It can be easy to miss if you're going through the hedge laboratories, so always start off near the deck area at the side of the hedge and then progress that way, and that will lead you directly to the laboratories. Absolutely make sure you peep every creature in the game as soon as you come across one. It gives you the strengths, the weaknesses, of course. So always scan a creature before you kill it. And then once you start gathering the resources from them, you've then got a chance of getting a gold card. Some creatures, the percentage chance is really low and you will have to re-kill them a bunch of times to hopefully get the all gold selection. You can unlock a mutation called Trapper Peeper and this will give you extra damage with critical hits against creatures you've already peeped. There's three levels of it and you have to pretty much get a whole ton of gold cards to unlock the final level. There's also achievement for getting all gold cards too. You also get told to go and take care of the mites chewing on the cable so that you can power on the mysterious machine. But do return here after you spoke to Burgle as there'll be some science points in the burrow and you hopefully be able to pick up these rocks if you've got a tier 2 hammer. It's either after you spoke to Burgle or you've turned the machine on that raw science will then start spawning in the world. In the early stages of the game you'll come across the remnants of explorers before you and some of them may have left some rotten weapons. The only difference between these and regular weapons is they'll do maybe slightly less damage and they may have a bit more durability taken away from them. But they can be really good as starter weapons or just having a spare and you can go ahead and upgrade them still too. What you might not realise though, there is brand new trinkets added to the game and one of them trinkets is a rotten berry. You find it's pretty close to the milk carton to the east of the oak tree. You'll have to either build up or drop down from the flower bed above with a tuft to get into the doorway. There's also a pretty OP weapon in here called the pinch whacker. Every tuber under the sun has shown this off but it's still worth pointing out in a good tips video. This can be something you can actually aim to get fairly early. You just need some fungal growth so maybe go and kill some infected mites at the edge of the haze and then just a red ant egg. So the pinch whacker is great but the rotten berry is almost even greater because it does give you an extra cloud of noxious gas when using rotten weapons that can do a lot of damage. And it's actually something you can tailor for builds even later in the game when you get more corrosive armour and particularly the larvae blade which does a small amount of poison damage. With this equipped plus other stuff that helps with poison you can really make an OP corrosive build. There's over 20 of these trinkets or charms. Some drop from random harvesting of food or only creatures like the ladybird larvae. Others you'll get in stat locations like these omnic cards, which there are six of them. These omnic cards give you a buff, but they also give you a negative as well. The drop rate for some of these is ridiculous. You may have to go and kill like the mantis or the broodmother hundreds of times to hopefully get the trinket that drops from them two bosses. 
so do go and watch my guide on all the trinkets if you're still a bit lost. Unfortunately, as of 1.03, you cannot craft any of the trinkets. So if you play a multiplayer, you're going to have to just separate them and have different builds using them. So I've briefly mentioned mutations. They really are your friend and can really help you make a creative build. So unlock as many as possible and it's definitely something I recommend you increase the most when you go to upgrade using the Mega Milks or Milk Motors. I'll explain that a little bit in a second. But mutations wise, there's different levels for some of them. Some of them drop from bosses, others from just killing creatures like the wolf spiders. So make sure you experiment. The wolf spider one gives you protection against some of its poison, so it's really super useful to get as early as possible. So do try and be brave and take on as many of the creatures as you can. You've never known what kind of reward you'll get for killing one. You can only start upgrading milk motors once you've gathered the first one and you do need a tier two hammer to do so. So talk to Burgle as soon as you've gathered one for the first time and then make sure you increase mutations and I would say healing as the first two. These will make a massive difference in replenishing your health over time or how much you actually get health from eating foods. Get five max mutation slots and you can really have some powerful builds towards the mid game. There's plenty of milk motors around and you will have enough milk motors to fully upgrade every single stat. But just FYI, there's no way to actually reset the points, so think carefully as you may still take a bit of time to discover all of them. Did you know there's at least six mutations that you only get through defeating bosses or mini bosses, like the assistant manager in the Black Ant Hill or even the infected ladybug in the haze? So bear that in mind if you're looking for some missing ones, you have to defeat all of the bosses to get every mutation. You may come across candy corns, they're a limited food so they don't always spawn only for the Halloween sort of full season and foods have a random chance of dropping in different stages. So if you come across a hot dog then the next day it might actually be an apple core. Effectively they rotate in and out about what type of food will spawn in that point but you generally get always food spawning in them same areas. A lot of the food will give you rotten pieces as well as hopefully some fresh, but do look out for specific pieces that are actually trinkets or charms. Any of the elemental foods, so salt, mince, sour or spicy cha-chas, as well as the ability to get them from hot dogs. Some have more chance than others, so you're just going to have to harvest as much food as you can, so never pass up the opportunity to chop into the foods that are listed. Most of the foods are tier 2, so you'll need a tier 2 axe or hammer to break them open, but the sour wormholes, they are tier 3. Never eat any of the candy that you come across as you're going to use it for upgrading later. Pretty obvious, but some of you guys might not have realised this and might be munching on it as a snack. The exception is mints. Eat one of these and you get the first level of the mutation fresh defence. Eat 5 of them, you get level 2 and eat 10 of them and you get level 3 which gives you 75% reduction against resistance to gas and burning damage and it will help you with sizzle. If you're in an emergency, you can eat a mint to help reduce some sizzle just there and then, but you're better off eating 10 of them as soon as you can and just equip the mutation if you run into any problems. Also FYI, mints don't respawn in containers, so the mint boxes or cups. They will respawn in places like the sandbox or just random spots, particularly in anthills. A lot of the food that you'll cook will eventually rot, although there is a cooler that you get late game that will keep things infinitely fresh. So where you can, try and save the granola bars that you'll come across, all in different laboratories or field stations, as these will not rot and they're really good for healing as well as giving you food, especially when taking on larger or more challenging creatures or bosses. The Grounded Devs really like parkour, so they've designed the map to be able to get around without having to build up pretty much everywhere. You can get to anything you need in terms of any rewards, food, science points or molars, just by using a tuft and some careful climbing. So just bear that in mind, if something looks unreachable, you don't have to waste too much resources building huge ramps, although it may still be a bit quicker if you suck at parkour. Can't figure out how to get pets? You need to make the food for them inside a grinder. You can make mushroom slurry, or either grass slurry or rotten food slurry to get the gnats, aphids and weevils. This is vital if you want more inventory space, so take the time to do so. You won't be able to have a house for them until you go ahead and unlock the unlocks from the haze. So only try and keep one pet at a time until you get the ability to craft a home for them. They die pretty easily, but you can get armor that increases their health and they also give you a health buff too. And their main point of course is just being able to carry more stuff. With Grounded having a slight inventory issue, it's definitely worth investing in getting used to having a pet around at all times. 
The upgrade system in Grounded isn't that great in terms of explaining how it works. Yes, you find plenty of quartzite stones or marble stones that you can then go ahead and upgrade your equipment to levels 1 to 5. But you're not able to upgrade the next levels until you go and get some of the chips from some of the laboratories and dungeons that you need to complete. That said, you'll find plenty of the brittle marble as well as the brittle quartzite which you can harvest with a tier 1 hammer. Use this, don't save it up. If you've got an arm set that you're happy with and a weapon that you've been doing good with, then go ahead and increase it. You will run out of them stones, they don't respawn, but eventually you'll come across, like I said, one of the chips that allows you to craft them out of bug parts and sap. Same thing applies to the next level, which upgrades level 6 and 7 in sturdy marble or sturdy quartzite, and these get crafted into whetstone or plates. But when you get to the Supreme, the third and final tier, you don't get as many of these stones around the yard, not until late game. So you really want to think about what armor or what weapons you really want to invest or upgrade. You have to repair your weapons at any stage before level five with just regular resources from bugs. But level six onwards, you need special glue to repair armor and weapons. So you might want to aim for the Black Anthill chip and laboratory as soon as you can because you'll get the glue masher which makes the glue and then you can go ahead and repair a bunch of stuff once you've upgraded it to level 6. Definitely one of the most requested features or comments I've seen is where to find some of these unlocks. So go and check out my chips guide where I told you exactly where and what you get from every single chip that you need to know about. Another tip to go over that is don't throw away any bug parts. As I said, you'll get recipes where you'll be able to craft unlimited amounts of the plating or whetstones that you need, but they do rely on bug parts and sap. So don't panic if it looks like you're running out of rocks because you've used them to go ahead and upgrade all of your stuff. Eventually you will get a recipe that allow you to craft it with them bug parts. Obviously the bug parts are useful for the glue as I mentioned and of course recipes. So never chuck them away, just store them away in case you need them later. The BLT and the Mantis Kebab that you need to summon the bosses of the Mantis and the Broodmother, they get refunded if you die while fighting it. Did you know that? So you only need to craft one the very first time that you go and take them on. However, if you want to farm them for parts and more later on, then you are going to need to craft more as you're probably going to be more successful as you get more experience. Facing off against creatures with weapons that are their weakness is really important as well as their elemental weaknesses and strengths or resistances. Once you work that out through peeping the creatures, you can really make a lot of encounters easier by making sure you're equipped to go in that area with the right stuff. The barbecue zone, for example, you need specialist armor if you want to go and gather some of the resources in there, including all of the charcoal. And so you need the antline armor because it helps reduce the sizzle. But also make sure you've got fresh equipped on some of your weapons as the ladybird larvae, they are weak against it. As a new player, it's going to take you a while to work out what areas have got what creatures, and you don't really unlock the ability to apply elemental damage types until you've gone well into like three or four dungeons, usually the Black Ant Hill and the Sandbox. So till you get that stage, focus more on the damage types if something's weak against stabbing or chopping, and try and have at least one weapon type on you at all times. So either a spear or a bow will count as stabbing, you should always have an axe and a hammer on you anyway to gather resources, so there's your hammer and chopping. Two-handed weapons like the Ant Club, they're actually labelled generic, so technically there's no real weaknesses or strengths with them against some of the creatures, but it's just a good all-rounder. And then you just got to make sure you've got a weapon that does maybe slashing damage, so usually either daggers or some of the larger blades like the Black Ant Blade. So pay attention to the creatures that you encounter in each biome, work out exactly which ones spawn and don't, and it'll help you in the long run when you're gathering resources or revisiting them places not to carry too much of the stuff you don't need. So that's 25 things I kind of wish I knew a little bit, maybe a little higgledy-piggledy, not really designed as a complete beginner's guide, but players that may be still struggling or had a few questions needing answering. Now I'm just going to rattle off some stuff that I feel is still useful, but in no particular order. Throwing spears is OP, in fact throwing lots of your weapons can do a big chunk of damage, but be careful, obviously it's easy for them to get lost as the prompt or the UI marker for them does not always show properly. It does also reduce your durability quite a bit, so make sure you've got plenty of stuff to repair it with. But I do find that more and more I'm relying on being able to throw my spears to really help me out in combat. Even after 600 hours in the game, I still kind of suck at parrying creatures. So make sure you've got more tools or mutations to help you. The parry master mutation you get by parrying creatures and that can really help with the window. The Koi armor set also increases the window for parry and making sure you've always got a shield and using more one-handed weapons. 
You lose more durability if you miss time an attack and only block or defend it, but obviously with a shield that means you're only reducing the shield rather than the weapon itself. In fact, if you really suck, make sure you've always got a shield on you, as obviously you don't want your armor sets getting absolutely wrecked as well. I definitely recommend getting used to parrying though, it's a powerful ability and it's the way the game is kind of designed to get the maximum out of things so you don't have to spend forever cheesing enemies with bows and arrows. There's a little healing pool in the barbecue zone, when you actually step in here you will replenish your health, so it's really good if you have been getting a little bit too burnt trying to get the charcoal or have encountered a bunch of the ladybirds. Quartzite and marble don't respawn, but all of the other resources pretty much do. Things like nails, as well as obviously all the foods, like I said, they rotate where they'll spawn, except if the case that like mints, they're inside a container. Likewise, bugs respawn as well. The newly added Black Widow takes around 14 in-game days to respawn, and there's four spots where you can find them on the map. So try and time where you go, like clear out one area at a time and then move on to the next. Make sure you keep track of when was the last time you visited, just to see if there's any more of the resources you want or creatures respawning. A lot of the bugs have obviously similar drops, so you think get things like antacid from a whole bunch of creatures and even ladybirds, they also drop ladybug parts. But there are some stuff that stays exclusive, like the ladybird shells that you need to make the ladybird shield, this is an exclusive drop to the ladybirds. Likewise with green shield bugs and stink bugs. In fact you get two unique resources from green shield bugs. You get the super stink bag and you get the green shield bug parts to craft torches and more. But some bug parts, especially things like horns from black ox horns, they don't always have a guaranteed chance to drop, as well as ladybug heads. So you may have to farm and kill a whole bunch of creatures sometimes to get the body part that you want from them. This might apply to every survival game going, but use creatures to fight other creatures. If they accidentally hit each other, nearly all of the bugs in the yard will start fighting. Use this to your advantage and help take out some of the stronger ones. Raids aren't as dangerous as they used to be, not until you get to the later stages of the game and you got much more used to it. But they will target specific points, so you should always know exactly where they're going to try and attack. So look out for any glowing red base peeled in pieces, and that's where they're li likely to turn up. In some of the laboratories, you'll come across rooms filled with resources, like the underwater laboratory, as well as the hedge, big rooms filled with stuff. You can use some of these to directly help you with some of the mixers. There's a mixer directly underneath the shed, so chuck down all of the stems and make sure you gather them up once you've completed the laboratory, and then go ahead and start building some defenses for the mixer for later on, especially as there are no weed stems in really close proximity in the hedge. This is highlighted even more when you get to the end of the game, when you're about to do the final kind of defense missions, you get a whole room filled of mushroom bricks, resources and more. Smoothies are your best friend when it comes to healing, but absolutely you want to be making as many mussel sprout smoothies as possible. You get these from the underwater pond lab and they do respawn. They'll give you an extra healing buff as well as whatever bonus they're meant to do. You can also of course make sticky versions using gum, but I still find that these are the ones that I rely on mostly. You're going to need tons of lint, so you're going to have to go and get it all from the mat in front of the shed or the glove that's near the trenches. But did you know there's over 100 pieces available inside the undershed and it respawns? You won't be able to get access to the undershed until you return four burgle chips, the super ones to burgle, but it's still worth knowing. So don't leave the shed until you've upgraded all of your weapons and you think you're ready to maybe go and take on the final bosses. Go in and explore, farm some of the resources and stuff you need, and then come back and face the bosses whenever you want. You'll never have to worry about lint again once you've gone through here once or twice. The map has a ton of little parkour shortcuts or tunnels to get you to different areas, but don't forget to rely on the good old grass blades. A lot of the time, if you're a bit patient and good at parkour, you can actually use them to get up to high places without having to rely on building. If you've died, make sure you go and replenish or recover your bag. They don't actually last forever, so it's always a good idea to make sure you get your resources. I'm not too sure of the time, but I've definitely lost some items in the past. Rather than waste resources repairing armor or weapons, or even glue, check to see if they need an upgrade, as that will also automatically repair them. A pretty obvious one, but it's one that some players don't realize. Grounded's been around a long time, so I've tried not to go over the most basic stuff or stuff I've done a billion guides or everyone else has, but there are some really crucial things you need to know, like wearing a full suit of red ant armor means you won't get attacked by any of the ants when you explore their hill, unless you go ahead and pick up any of their eggs. 
Be warned though, this doesn't apply to black ant armor or the fire ant armor. They will attack you regardless when you're inside their hill. A lot of creatures sleep at night time, so make sure that you take advantage of it. Things like spiders particularly will stay more asleep during the night, but you may encounter other creatures that you need to get like the firebugs. Before you sleep, make sure you've got anything that you're about to cook or craft or make in your oven or your grinder or your web maker, make sure it's going as it will quickly make that stuff while you're sleeping. So always check to see if there's something you need to craft as it will be done by the time you wake up in the morning. Another little map hack is to go ahead and crack the bomb underneath the shovel. That will get you up to the picnic table a lot quicker and easier than having to build and it's pretty much meant to be the way that you go. The picnic table is one of the best places you can go to go ahead and get crow feathers. Generally, whenever you see the crow and it's going around the yard, wherever it's landed, that's where you will find hopefully some feathers. So keep track of that as well if you're desperate for more, as they have nerfed how many you get from drops lately. Rust is a new resource in 1.0. It's a tier 3 item, so you won't be able to get it until you get a tier 3 hammer, but it's still relatively early or easy to get hold of a lot of it once you go to the picnic table. I recommend as soon as you get that tier 3 hammer, you try and get yourself the rusty spear, as in my opinion it's one of the better mid to late game weapons you can get. You use chewed gum to plug the haze canister, it will stop the haze gas from spreading, but it does mean that you'll get more infection spread across the whole yard, and it even extends up to the upper yard where we've got the new berry bushes. This is how you eventually you'll get infected wolf spiders. There's places also where chewed gum hides stuff, like maybe mega milk or milk molars, and maybe keys to get certain recipes, like the bomb arrows. So yeah, although I say don't use them as much as the muscle sprouts for your smoothies, they obviously give extra benefit to your smoothies, giving you the buffs, damage buffs, particularly for longer amount of time. FYI, bees can be aggressive, but they're more aggressive when you go closer to the picnic table. Generally, as long as you don't get right up in their face while exploring the rest of the yard, they'll leave you alone. But as soon as you get anywhere close to them on the picnic table, they will wig out. The Coupe de Gras is a two-stage mutation that gives extra critical damage and it's pretty imperative for a lot of players. You need to turn the dice over to side 20 using a red ant club or something stronger. The second one is located in an underwater cave in the wetlands towards the hedge. I've done plenty of videos on this in the past, so look them up. But yeah, make sure you get this. When it comes to buying upgrades, always focus on getting yourself either weapons or crafting stuff. I tend to ignore the signs as I'm not that decorative person. You don't have to be in a rush, but anything that's going to help you find either scabs, raw science or milk molars is definitely a priority over some of them cosmetics. I mentioned infected wolf spiders won't spawn until you've turned off the haze, Well, that also applies to burrs. There are certain things that won't happen until you get far into the game. So if you want burr flooring, then yes, you need to turn off the haze. There are certain creatures controlled by transmitters that you'll encounter in the upper yard, where they won't actually start spawning across the rest of the yard until you've gone and explored and defeated everything inside the undershed. So you've been playing the game and wondering why you're seeing maybe harder versions of creatures in a lower yard, it's probably because you have just completed the undershed area. You are meant to be able to reduce the amount of these orc creatures that spawn but you are going to have to go and finish off Molduk's castle. So there we go, hopefully uh, something for everyone. Let me know your big tips that I haven't maybe mentioned in this video and maybe I'll do a viewers comments video soon. So until next time I'll catch you rat bags later.